Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you CRAMSurge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Today we'll uh, um, have a good look at a paper that talks about uh, gallbladder perforation and risk of postoperative abscess uh, with or without the use of antibiotics. This is a, a large national cohort study uh, from Sweden. Uh, Professor Sabah Balasubramanian is then uh, going to continue his talks on evidence-based medicine and today we are particularly going to talk about the use of search databases. I'll leave you to it. So yeah, I'm Melissa. I'm an ST2 in general surgery currently in Leeds um, and uh, Today we're going to talk to you about a paper that was recently uh, published in the British Journal of Surgery um, this year, um, and it's titled Intraoperative Gallbladder Perforation and the Risk of Postoperative Abscess with or Without Antibiotics, and it's a national cohort study of more than 108,000 cholecystectomies, and the link can be found on this page. So over to you for the background, Gio. Wonderful. A little bit of background about this um, topic more than the study itself. Uh, we do know that uh, cholecystectomy is performed very commonly in uh, this country. Up to 70,000 of these operations are performed every year. Uh, and biliary disease is a lead cause of um, admission and morbidity and sometimes mortality uh, in uh, the UK population. Um, a variety of studies have been conducted uh, concerning the role of antibiotics in gallbladder surgery. Uh, this applies both to elective situations or um, situations where there is an acutely inflamed gallbladder. And a few previous core studies um, with a relatively limited number of patients involved showed no difference in therapeutic versus prophylactic antibiotics use in presence of um, infection in terms of SSIs and particularly intra-abdominal infections. Um, we recently had a fairly big trial coming out, um, a, the PNAS2 trial, uh, which uh, uh, actually explored the role of prophylactic antibiotics in the presence of um, acute cholecystitis when performing a cholecystectomy, um, failing to demonstrate the non-inferiority of the no-prophylactic antibiotic strategy. So we do know that antibiotics do play a role uh, and there is good evidence out there. now. Uh, this core study tries to kind of uh, fit in all of this and provide uh, a bit of additional evidence, particularly in terms of the degree of contamination. Uh, so, ball back to Melissa for um, uh, the aims. Yeah, so the aims of the study was to assess whether there was an association between intraoperative gallbladder perforation with or without fully retrieved stones and the risk of post-operative abscess. And they also wanted to know whether antibiotic treatment prevented abscess formation. So trying to fit this into the PICO format, they looked specifically at adults, so those aged above 18 years old in Sweden who had undergone a cholecystectomy. They were particularly interested in looking at gallbladder perforation with or without stone spillage. So the control was no gallbladder perforation. And the outcome or the primary outcome was post-operative abscess at day 30. So we put a bit of a question mark and IA there because there wasn't any further elaboration on this uh, definition of, of abscess and we weren't really sure whether it was intra-abdominal abscess or whether it was abscess associated with an SSI. And methods over to you, Gio. Fantastic. So as Melissa mentioned, this is a retrospective core study um, which is supposedly um, drawn from a prospectively maintained national database. Um, this data set called the Goal Risk uh, has been around for quite a few years now um, in uh, Sweden and covers the vast majority of cholecystectomies performed. Um, the authors um, that did uh, generate this particular data set for auditing purposes actually um, published a wonderful paper describing it uh, in the Swedish. Um, so we don't really know for sure what degree of validation this data set is subject to. 
uh, and how rigorous the data collection is um, is a little bit hard to to say for sure. The authors do reference this this paper, which obviously is not in English. Um, so um, despite our best effort, we can't tell you more than that. Um, well, over 100,000 cholecystectomies were uh, extrapolated from this data set uh, performed between 2008 and 2019. A few cases were excluded with missing data or operations that were originally uh, planned as open operations or operations conducted for indications basically other than gallstones. Um, the authors planned a multivariate um, analysis um, with a number of variables that's available from the data set and we'll have a look into this. Um, in a little bit, because uh, um, the data set is relatively limited in what it captures. And the primary outcome of the study is, again, as Melissa mentioned, possibility of with within 30 days. Uh, a bit unclear uh, where the abscess is supposed to be, if it includes only um, organ space infection um, or else. In any case, um, this is where we are. Uh, so a ball to Melissa for uh, uh, a bit more, starting some results. Yep, so um, the database had a, a, a large amount of um, data on cholecystectomies, but once they, um, the authors applied the inclusion and exclusion criteria, they ended up with um, over 108,000 cholecystectomies. Um, and this table represents, uh, is a table extracted from the paper itself, and it demonstrates um, some of the de demographic data that they um, included um, or were able to obtain from this database itself. Um, and as you can see, they were able to get information on sex, age, ASA grade, uh, the number of procedures which were performed specifically for acute cholecystitis, the approach, whether it was laparoscopic or open, and the antibiotic treatment. Um, a thing that we noticed was that um, this is quite a limited amount of information, especially when we're looking at um, infection risk or abscess formation. Um, and we thought quite a lot of uh, vital information like um, BMI and diabetes or other comorbidities, which are known to um, increase the risk of uh, post-operative um, infections were actually not included. Um, and another thing to point out is the antibiotic definition, which is included in this table. Um, they included no antibiotics. They also included prophylactic antibiotics antibiotics, which, which was defined as antibiotic treatment for less than one day. And then the therapeutic definition was antibiotic treatment for more than one day. But whether that day was pre or post operative, we, we don't know. And then the rest of the results over to you, Gio. Wonderful. So um, the primary outcome, uh, that is to say abscess, happened in um, 1,320 patients. So 2.7% of the overall uh, data set. Um, a perforation of the gallbladder, and that is assumed to be something that happens during the operation. However, it's not specified by the author, so it argued it could have happened before the operation and just found that operation. It happened in 33.8% of the cases. The authors produced two, basically, what I assume are binomial logistic regression models, um, looking at predictors of the development of interabdominal abscess. And the first one splits the operations into gallbladder operations without perforation. The other one, gallbladder operation with a perforation. The second model does split operations in operations that involve a perforation with potentially a stone remaining in the abdomen and all the other operations. So perforations and non-perforation in absence of a significant degree of contamination. As you can see, both in both cases, the um, presence of a perforation or contamination does increase the risk of abscess, which is kind of expected, uh, with an odds ratio that is um, statistically significant in both cases, slightly higher in presence of a retained stone. Um, they also look in this um, binomial logistic regression model um, at uh, the uh, potential advantage associated with the use of antibiotics. And if you look at this um, second part of the slide, you can see that prophylactic antibiotics or, or antibiotics with the purpose of treatment um, don't really make a difference in terms of development of a postoperative abscess. There is, however, one caveat that has to do with cases where there is a significant degree of contamination with potentially retained stones, where it looks like antibiotics are increasing the risk of abscess. Now, the way I interpret this result is 
either that the use of antibiotics is associated to a choice because there is such a degree of contamination that the formation of an abscess is more likely or a pure and simple spurious result from multiple statistical testing. A third hypothesis I make is that perhaps there's a lot of emitted variables. In any case, um, these are the setting results. Um, Bold to you, Melissa. Yeah, so um, in terms of limitations, so the authors acknowledge um, a couple of limitations um, and one of these being um, the limited information available on or around antibiotics. So they weren't able to tell us the type or the timing of antibiotics. Um, so this is quite important, especially if we're going to try to extrapolate these results into clinical practice. It's, um, we need to know a little bit more about antibiotics. Um, they also acknowledged the fact that the database had lack of um, information on specific uh, variables, um, and this was something that they completely acknowledged. Um, but in terms of other limitations that we discussed or we, we thought of uh, whilst reading the paper was the um, overall lack of definitions for multiple things. So the definition of abscess, um, the definition of antibiotic treatment and the definition of perforation. We're not quite sure uh, what they mean by all these terms. And um, again, it's quite important for us to know these things. Um, also, the quality of the data set. Again, it's unclear. Um, on um, or they didn't they didn't really provide us with the, the ability to look at um, information regarding this data set and the database itself. And um, so we're not sure whether there, it is validated or what its primary purposes was to see whether or not this type of study um, is appropriate to use this database for this type of study. Um, and then again, yeah, the omitted variables that we've mentioned. Uh, so that potentially could produce quite a lot of bias in terms of the results. And we feel like there's quite some important things that they've missed out uh, for their um, uh, multivariate uh, regression model. Um, and we've also mentioned about the multiple statistical testing may be uh, the reason why they had um, some spurious results or results that we're not quite sure of uh, their interpretation. And they also use odds ratios when it was a cohort study, even though it may be appropriate for um, the uh, logistical regression model, um, we were not quite sure whether or not it was um, the appropriate method. And over to you for the conclusion. Right, so based on the results of this study and uh, from data from this data set, we could say that the perforation of the gallbladder, it does increase the risk, well, the odds in this particular case, uh, of developing an abscess. And this becomes even more uh, relevant if there is a significant degree of contamination with potential lost stones. In this context, the authors did not find a difference uh, between a prophylactic approach or a therapeutic approach to contamination itself, and neither of them uh, were actually statistically significantly associated with the reduction in the development of um, abscess. And a few points that relate to this uh, particular study, um, we have highlighted them through the presentation. They're reported here in the table, as you can see. So that's us. A brief summary of the discussion we had about the paper. Uh, we did reiterate a good few points uh, that were highlighted during the presentation, particularly the role of selection bias in the context of um, prospective cohort studies. Uh, particularly, this applies in this study um, to the results suggesting that the use of antibiotics in presence of a gallbladder perforation with significant contamination potentially increase the risk of abscess formation. Uh, now, uh, this uh, is obviously not biologically plausible uh, and is likely a result of either selection bias or less likely multiple statistical testing uh, producing a spurious result. Uh, we then talked about potential uh, statistical techniques that can be used to reduce the um, multiple statistical testing issues, such as a Bonferroni correction and other techniques. And we discussed their role. Uh, we moved on to then discuss the importance of large um, database studies and large cohort studies in corroborating findings from uh, randomized controlled trials. And we also highlighted how it is risky and potentially misleading to withdraw conclusions concerning 
a causative effect of a particular intervention in the context of a large cohort study, not designed for this particular type of analysis. I will then leave you to Professor Balasubramanian lecture. Enjoy. Okay, so um, we've been talking about the steps of evidence-based medicine. So we've done a few uh, uh, sessions on uh, ask and acquire. So the five steps are, as you can see on the screen, there's ask the right question, acquire the evidence, appraise the evidence, apply the evidence to your practice and evaluate your application of the, of the evidence. So those are the five steps of evidence-based medical practice. Um, we have uh, spent some time talking about ask, asking the right clinical question. Um, we talked about study designs. We talked about foreground and background questions. And we talked about the PICO format. So those YouTube videos are up there so if you wanted to have a look. We then talked about acquiring the evidence. And in acquiring the evidence, I have previously focused on search techniques. How do you search literature? Use PubMed database as an example. And we talked about a couple of scenarios in clinical practice whereby we have generated some questions and searched the literature. So in the next, say, 10 minutes, uh, we'll talk about types of research databases and the kind of topics they cover, um, primary research versus pre-appraised evidence, the advantages and disadvantages of these. And then I've got a slide on how I go about obtaining full text, but uh, it'll be interesting to hear um, your experiences and comments. So there are lots and lots, of, lots and lots of research databases, as you know, hundreds, but I suspect most people just use one or two. I use PubMed quite a lot. And if you get used to using one database, then you tend to just um, go back to that database um, again and again, as opposed to try out new databases. So some databases are multidisciplinary. It covers a variety of fields, including medicine, physics, chemistry, and you name it. Whereas um, some uh, databases focus just on medicine and biological sciences. And I've just named a few, but there are obviously lots and lots uh, more. With regards to medical research databases, there's a lot of differences between individual databases. And you've got to keep in mind that no single database is actually a comprehensive list of all of the literature on a particular topic. And if you're doing a systematic review, as opposed to just trying to answer a clinical question, you really uh, need to be searching two or three databases. If you do a systematic review and say you've just done the PubMed or Embase, then often the reviewers will come back and say, oh, maybe you've got to look at another database. So you've got some general medical databases like PubMed and Embase, and then you've got some specialist databases. DARE is one, DARE in the Cochrane Library uh, is a uh, uh, database of systematic reviews. And then you've got some databases that focus on specific specialties in medicine. Sometimes you just think, and I've been asked this question, why can't I just Google? Why don't I have a clinical question? I know um, what kind of answer I'm looking for. I'll just use Google and a general search engine. It's quick. You can access it easily. You can look for availability of full text. And sometimes you find that there is no paper on PubMed that addresses that particular clinical question, but then you can get a little bit of information on Google about that particular um, question. As long as you understand that uh, with a Google search, there's very limited control on the searches and you can land on to all kinds of websites which provide known research information, which is not peer reviewed, patient uh, information, leaflets, um, patient forums, uh, discussion forums, and so on. As long as you're aware of that and don't, don't get too carried away with what you find, then that's probably um, not a very bad idea. Right, so uh, we'll, let's talk about primary research and pre-appraised evidence. Now, a lot of people would classify the source of information into two or three categories. I've got three categories here. 
So when we say primary research, we mean original manuscripts um, where uh, original research has been done. And sometimes it's not a full manuscript, it's just a dissertation. People these days um, tend to publish a thesis online for people to make use of. So that's primary research. Then you've got secondary um, uh, research, which basically refers to, often refers to a systematic review of meta-analysis, sometimes practice guidelines and standards, which often incorporate a systematic search strategy. So these are secondary sources of information. And then there's something called tertiary. Some people use the phrase tertiary um, source of information, which is basically a summary of systematic reviews, books maybe, and also things like the CCA, the Cochrane Clinical Answers, which um, uh, essentially uh, is um, an attempt to answer a clinical question on a topic relating to a Cochrane review. So that could be considered tertiary. So when we say pre-appraised evidence, um, you could argue that anything that is not primary research could be considered as pre-appraised. So uh, you may have come across this pyramid, the Haynes pyramid. There are a number of variations of these um, you will find, but essentially this is a pyramid uh, that gives you some guidance on finding pre-appraised evidence. So as you can see, right at the bottom of the pyramid, you've got um, studies, essentially original articles. And then on top, of, uh, on top of that, you've got systematic reviews, systematic reviews of original articles. And then layer three is systematically derived um, recommendations or guidelines. And layer four is a synthesized summary, which essentially integrates layer one, two, and three. And then finally, you've got systems. Now, I don't really understand much about symptoms, systems, but uh, apparently um, it refers to the process of integrating the evidence from all of these four layers into an electronic patient record or into a computerized decision support system. So I think this is for the future where people are anticipating that you, uh, you use computerized records for everything. And then when you make a diagnosis or you have a certain uh, particular symptom, you can, you are able to, or you are provided with up-to-date uh, evidence on that particular diagnosis um, as part of your electronic health record. So that's probably a future that we, we can, I think we'll have to still um, dream about. It's not here yet. So if you have a clinical question, um, the, the, the next step is, you know, uh, you're searching for evidence and you're thinking, should I use primary research? Should I look up an or original article or should I look up some practice guideline? Now, it really depends partly on the kind of clinical question. And there's this interesting systematic review published about eight years ago, which looked at a number of different studies uh, looking at uh, clinical questions. And they suggested that uh, clinicians would probably ask one clinical question for every two patients seen, which I thought was quite a large number. And only in half of these for these questions do clinicians actually go and search for the answers. And in the search for the answers, they get the answer they want three-fourths of the time. And of the types of questions, about a third relate to drug treatment, and a significant proportion of the rest relate to either a symptom, physical finding, or a diagnostic test. In a more recent paper, this is from PLOS One this year, and researchers asked a number of primary care doctors to note down the clinical questions they might encounter as they go through their uh, consultations. And uh, they, they got a list of about 200 valid clinical questions. And of these, 132 were background questions and only 74 were foreground questions. You probably remember the difference between background questions and foreground questions. So of the foreground questions, the questions were on differential diagnosis, diagnostic accuracy, etiology harm, prognosis, and so on and so forth. Now, I found this uh, quite interesting in that I don't think we'll get similar answers if we survey surgeons. I suspect that we'll be very different to primary care doctors. 
And uh, I can understand why primary care doctors have a lot of background questions. So they might come across a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism or a patient who's probably had treatment for Borhoff syndrome, and they'd want to know all about that particular disease because they probably wouldn't have encountered a similar patient for a while. But you're not going to have a specialist colorectal surgeon um, who does some specialist pelvic floor clinics to be looking um, for answers to background questions. Does that make sense? Do you um, any comments? Um, yeah, I do think it makes sense. And I agree, it has to do with your degree of sub subspecialization almost. And presumably also your ability to pinpoint your answer. Yeah. Um, and, and identify a source that's adequate to give you the answer you need. So also the answer sought and answer found statistics would change. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. So, yeah, so the question type is really important. You know, if you're going to, if you have a background question and you think, I really don't know about this syndrome or this disease, then obviously you're not going to look for original articles. You're going to look at a textbook or you're going to look uh, at a review article. Yeah. Or uh, you might just read up a practice guideline from NICE on that particular subject. Now, there are lots of other factors as well, and that will influence whether you're looking for a, an original article or pre appraised evidence. So, speciality, like we talked about, whether you're a primary care person or you're a hospital doctor. Degree of specialization as well. Um, you know, uh, are you a general surgeon or are you a pituitary surgeon or a hand surgeon that doesn't do anything else? Um, you a specialty, are you in a specialty where it's primarily craft-based? Um, so you're not really going to be uh, uh, looking for original articles uh, to that much of an extent as somebody else um, who is probably relatively new to that specialty or that particular uh, kind of working. Clinical experience and knowledge also will influence whether you're going to look at primary research or pre-appraised evidence. If you're extremely experienced uh, in that particular area and you work in that area for 20 years, uh, you'll be familiar with the guidelines. So often you'll have questions that uh, relate to rare phenotypes, uh, unusual findings that you've never come across before. And then you'll probably be looking for similar case reports or, or original studies. What about appraisal and methodology understanding? So um, if you are not very confident with clinical, uh, critical appraisal, um, then you probably are not uh, going to be too keen on reading an original paper. You'd rather go with um, what uh, the NICE guidance says on that particular topic. And the final thing is time constraints. Apparently, I didn't know this, there's a 90 second rule apparently, and um, most primary care doctors, if they think they can't get an answer within 90 seconds, they'd say, don't bother looking. Um, maybe refer on to the hospital. So uh, I think there are some advantages in looking at original studies. The advantages are that uh, you, you get to access the original data and then you get to uh, appraise the evidence yourself. And also the big advantage is that it's going to be uh, fairly recent. You're not going to uh, find very recent um, data in pre-appraised evidence. The downside is obviously it'll be time consuming. Uh, we've appraised a primary research paper today. Uh, and sometimes it could be expensive depending on uh, how much access you have to um, published original articles. The advantages of pre-appraised evidence are one, it saves you a, a lot of time. A single systematic review will summarize data from many different studies. And if you want a very broad answer to a question, like for example, I'll give you an example from my ideas. Let's say you want to know about central neck dissection in thyroid cancer. And then you could look up nice guidance or you could look up a, a systematic review of central neck dissection and, and you get a lot of information. The downside is, if you have a very focused question, um, let's say you want to know about whether to do unilateral or bilateral central neck dissection in a specific subtype of thyroid cancer, let's say Hertel cell cancer, then you may not necessarily find an, uh, an answer uh, from pre 
appraised evidence. You might want a specific paper addressing a topic because there is unlikely to be many papers on that topic and there's unlikely to be systematic reviews addressing that specific focus question. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, practice guidelines get out of date. They're not often updated. And um, there is something called the living systematic review. There are efforts being made to uh, constantly update practice guidelines, but that's a huge uh, cumbersome task and we, we're not there yet. The final thing to say is that this is process information. So with process information, you lose granularity and you don't really understand the finer details of, uh, uh, of how the study was done. And uh, also, if you rely too much on practice guidelines and uh, um, evidence that has been processed for you, uh, I think you'll gradually lose critical appraisal techniques that you might have gathered over the years. Finally, access to full text information. So uh, I'd be keen to hear your comments, but how do you get full text? So a lot of the full text uh, papers, you know, these days can be accessed via journal websites. There are many journals that have article processing charges. They charge the authors to publish, and then they put them all online for people to access. So for the readers, it's free, but the authors pay uh, um, a lot of money. And then there's some um, websites like PMC, PubMed Central, like ResearchGate, that often provide free access as well, in addition to journal websites. Another um, thing to do is to ask your um, hospital librarian or your university librarian and to get some papers. And if it's just a couple of papers, then most of the time they'll, they'll uh, oblige. Uh, obviously, if you're doing a systematic review and need 150 full text manuscripts, then you might have a problem. Um, as a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and the International Surgical Society, um, I get access to full texts of many different journals, surgical journals primarily. Sometimes, on occasion, I have emailed authors. If I find some really interesting paper that I can't get access to, I find the authors, uh, do a bit of Google search on them, get their email ID and send them an email. And very often they'll oblige if you, if you send them a polite email saying you're really interested in that paper, a lot of them, if they have the time and if, it, if they have it to hand, will reply. Another way is uh, in getting manuscripts is to just talk to colleagues in other places. So if you're a university, if in Sheffield, you can't get the paper and you have some colleague in London, you will find that um, the, the, the different universities have different subscriptions and you can often get uh, other people to get some interesting article for you. And finally, um, you know, you've probably heard of the Hinari, um, which is a system set up by the World Health Organization, which provides access to full text um, from thousands of journals to um, low income people in medium and low income countries. That's it really. So we talked about research databases, very, uh, just a very brief overview. Primary research versus pre-appraised evidence, advantages and disadvantages. And if you've not heard of this before, then you've heard it now, Haynes 5S Pyramid. And we talked about how to access full text. So that kind of concludes our discussion on, on uh, the second step of EVM. So now I think for future talks, we can move on to the third step, which is probably the more interesting, the more meaty step of EVM, which is appraising the evidence. We've already done a few talks on appraising the evidence, but uh, I'll aim to cover um, all of the topics that I mentioned in the core competencies in, in under the category of appraising in future talks. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.